Now programming from the Illinois Channel, an independent nonpartisan corporation formed to provide nonpartisan coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. For more information on the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org. Just ahead, Governor Rauner is joined by other legislators as he signs the Trust Act, which says local law enforcement cannot ask people about their immigration status when a victim of or reporting a crime. Then in 15 minutes, we head to the House floor for a debate over Senate Bill 1947, which would reform the state's school funding formula. Following that, in about 55 minutes, Senate President John Cullerton holds a press conference to discuss the passage of SB 1947. In about one hour and five minutes, we'll hear from Democrat State Senators Andy Menar and Kimberly Lightford as they discuss the passage of SB 1947. Then in about one hour and 20 minutes, we get the GOP response from State Senators Jason Barrickman and Sue Rezin to the passage of SB 1947. And finally, in about one hour and 35 minutes, we first talk to GOP state reps Jeannie Ives and David McSweeney, who were opposed to SB 1947 after the original House vote failed. We'll then talk to education executives Michael Jacoby and Dr. Brent Clark, and later State Representative Will Davis, who all support SB 1947, after the bill passed the House on the second vote. That's all just ahead, after a brief word from one of our advisory council members. Hi, I'm Jim McNamee, President of the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association. Since 1985, we work to educate the public and those who serve as trustees and pension boards about issues that impact the financial health of publicly funded pensions. Our members manage over $18 billion in pension assets. That's a huge number. But we never forget those dollars belong to the men and women who've worked as firefighters, police officers, and as educators. We want them to know that their pension dollars are safely invested. They also want to know that someone will keep an eye on legislation that could threaten their pension. And that's why the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association is fighting against laws that would reduce the pensions earned by our members. And this is why we support the work of the Illinois Channel. Their unbiased, in-depth coverage of the pension reform issue allows us and our members to hear arguments on both sides of the pension issue. To follow legislation as it moves through committee, or to hear unedited interviews with key lawmakers as they discuss what changes are being considered. Pensions are very important. They're also very complex. Pension reform can't adequately be covered in sound bites. But the Illinois Channel provides a connection to the Capitol, the governor, and lawmakers that we all need to stay on top of key issues. Hi, I'm Jim McNamee, president of the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association. I watch the Illinois Channel, and I hope you do too. Next, from Chicago, Governor Rauner is joined by other legislators as he signs the Trust Act, which says local law enforcement cannot ask people about their immigration status when a victim of or reporting a crime. This runs about 15 minutes. First of all, I would like to thank the governor for inviting me to a bill signing ceremony for my bill. Thank you, Governor. Governor, these Bill signing ceremonies are so much more fun than veto ceremonies. So we should do this more often. Thank you very much. Now, five and a half blocks from here, five and a half blocks from here, just north, is a street called Cullerton Street. Is anybody familiar with Cullerton Street? Anybody live on Cullerton Street? Oh, okay, there's some people raise their hand. We don't want to change the name of that street, right? We want to keep it Cullerton Street. It's not named after me. Surprise. It's named after my great-grandfather's brother, who was elected state representative in 1873, who died in 1920, and when he died, they named the street after him, okay? His father, my great-great-grandfather, was an undocumented immigrant from Ireland in 1835, all right? So, when people say, we're all immigrants, I agree with that, and I even have some evidence of that in this neighborhood. And I think about my family when I think about 
my desire to sponsor this bill. And there's been many speakers who've talked about the value of this bill for the undocumented community. But let me, let me make another point. You know, I sponsored the driver's license bill. The driver's license bill was obviously a very good bill for people who wanted to become legal when they drove their car, right, who were undocumented, but it also helped everybody else because you had to take a test to get the driver's license and you had to make sure that you had insurance. So if you got in a car crash, everybody had insurance. So there was a benefit to not just the, the uh, undocumented, there was a benefit to the whole society. And the same thing is true with the Trust Act, right? It's obviously uh, a benefit to an undocumented person to know that the police uh, is, are not going to be putting them in, under suspicion everywhere they go, everywhere they walk out to try to go shopping or interact with their community. But it also benefits all of us, all of us, because now you know that if you see a person committing a crime, you can go and report that crime. You can get a bad person off the street because you don't feel that you yourself are going to be endangered. And that's why it is so critical that we uh, think about the benefit to all of society. And it's true, there's been a lot of uh, demagoguing on this bill. And that's why it, 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 it's, it's really uh, important that we thank the governor for standing up to those people and signing the bill. I want to tell him, though, that there's, as was pointed out, there's many more things that we can work on to try to help the immigrant community. And I'm looking forward to continue to do that. Thank you very much, Governor. At this time, I would like to recognize our Latino Caucus Chairman, Senator Martin Sandoval, who will join us here today. I just want to... Buenos dias. Pueblo unido jamás será vencido. Escúchame. Pueblo unido jamás será vencido. Pueblo unido jamás será vencido. Ese es el espíritu hoy día de esta... Mañana en celebración de este gran acontecimiento. I want to thank uh, President Cullerton and my colleagues, Senator Harmon, Senator Bitts, Senator Munoz, Senator Castro. Let's hear it for the state senate that is in the house today. In the senate. President Cullerton, once again, I want to thank you not only for leading us in our agenda in the Illinois Senate, but being really uh, a, a true giant when it comes to moving the immigrant agenda forward. Your, your leadership over the last 30, 40 years in the Illinois General Assembly has brought, us, has brought us quality of life to the people, particularly who I represent, over the last 20 years. Muchas gracias, el Presidente Cullerton, por su liderazgo. Yo sé que ya me están jalando aquí, pero de... <laughs> Governor Ron, can I just have a few minutes? Just a couple minutes? Boss, it's okay. <laughs> You know, Illinois has been the land of freedom and democracy, and today is no different. From Abraham Lincoln, who emancipated the slaves, an Illinoisan, to Ronald Reagan, who passed the last immigration reform in 1986, and to name others like George W. Bush, who led the last effort in Washington to pass an immigration reform, to even the, the, form, the senator of Arizona, John McCain, who was a sponsor of that immigration reform. These were great men from Illinois and from other states who led the challenge and delivered dignity and justice to people in this country in Illinois. And today, Governor Rauner, you stand in the midst of these great men, particularly of President Lincoln and of uh, President Reagan, who, who provided justice and equality and dignity to the people of Illinois. I want to thank you for your leadership today in signing this bill. Yeah, no. A todos los grupos de la comunidad, yo soy producto de la inmigración ilegal de México, de Guanajuato y de Michoacán. Es un orgullo hoy día, sí, es un orgullo estar aquí con todos ustedes en ser testamento a esta uh, firma del gobernador, que ha sido el logro de muchos de ustedes hoy día en este... Asamblea, especialmente mis, mis colegas y el autor de esta ley, el Presidente Cullerton. Muchas gracias. Ya que celebrar este gran momento.
Ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to introduce our final speaker for today. If we could please all stand and welcome our governor from the great state of Illinois, Bruce Rauner. Good morning. Buenos dias. Muchas gracias. Tak som yuke. Yon kan lite svenska. Good dog. My grandparents were proud immigrants to the United States of America, here to Illinois in the late 1800s. My grandparents did not speak English when they were young. My grandparents lived in a little double wide trailer. They had almost no money. They had some dairy cows and they had some corn. But they were my best friends growing up. They gave me my values. They taught me three things that are important to a good life. Hard work, working hard for ever, everything that you do, giving 100% your best effort, getting a great education, because education is the key to a better life, every generation and every generation. And number three, they said, Bruce, always give back in your community. We have a moral duty to help each other, to work together. And everybody needs some help. We have a duty to help. Now, Martin Sandoval, you just heard from Martin. I am a big fan of this gentleman. He is a great leader of the Latino Caucus in the General Assembly. He's a great leader for the people of Chicago, and he's a great public servant for the people of Illinois. Martin. As I say most every Sunday morning, as I speak at churches around the state of Illinois, I say, the good Lord did not make us Democrats or Republicans. The good Lord put us on earth to do his work, to help each other, work together, make our world a better place. And I believe very passionately in my soul, a primary reason that America is the greatest nation on earth is because we are a nation of immigrants. We are all from somewhere else, We've all come to America for freedom and opportunity. Yep. One of the reasons I love Illinois so much, so passionately, I was born here. I was born in Chicago, just south of Wrigley Field. I lived in the city or around the city pretty much my entire life. I love it. This is a great city, and I believe this is the greatest state in the greatest nation on earth. One of the main reasons we are a great state is because we are a welcoming state. We love to have people come from around the nation and around the world to come and work here in the great state of Illinois. This bill takes us in a step continuing to be a welcoming state. This was not an easy bill to pass, let's be clear. This took months and months of difficult negotiations. And I would like to personally call out, I, I, Greg, I think, is still here somewhere. I'd like to give a round of applause and a thank you to Greg Sullivan, the head of the Illinois Sheriff's Association. He's back by the window. He led many of the negotiations to have this be a, a good, reasonable bill. Not easy to do. Many folks with different points of view, many different opinions. And this was a very reasonable, decent outcome. Took a lot of effort. Now, I called many, many leaders in our law enforcement community about this bill, because I wanted to do the right thing. There were many people who don't like the bill, many people don't understand the bill, many people advocate for the bill. I work for all the people of Illinois. I wanted to do the right thing. I called those leaders in the immigrant community, I called leaders in the business community, but I especially wanted to seek out our leaders in our law enforcement, our police officers. And let me just say, I personally believe that police officers are our heroes. Our police officers keep us safe, put their personal safety on the line for all of us. We owe our police officers an incredible debt of gratitude for what they do to protect all of us here in Illinois. And what the police officers made clear to me is this bill, because I asked them, should I sign this bill? Should I not sign this bill? There are many people who don't want me to sign this bill, many people. But I am very pro-immigration. I've been pro-immigration my whole life. 
I have been very pro comprehensive immigration reform for my whole life. But I asked, I asked the police officers, what should I do? What would you recommend? This is not easy. I know this is very, you know, there's controversy with this. I asked leaders in law enforcement, should I veto this bill or sign this bill? They all said to me, Governor, this is a reasonable compromise. It will help us do our jobs better. It will help us keep our communities safer for all the people of Illinois. And I said, that's the right answer, then I will sign this bill. Yep. Police, we have limited resources. We don't have unlimited resources. And police officers' time is valuable. We are suffering from crime in too many neighborhoods and too many communities. Too many communities are not as safe as they should be. Our police officers need to focus on keeping folks safe. If we divert resources and police officers' time to paperwork as opposed to keeping people safe, we all lose. This bill is very simple, very straightforward. I think the bill started off as a 40-some page document, came down to, I think, two pages. It basically says, it says, this is important, that police officers can, can, and, can and should continue to communicate fully with federal immigration officials. That's appropriate. But it also says, that federal judicial rulings about Fourth Amendment protections and not detaining people beyond whatever they're being, uh, crime they may have or illegal activity they may have engaged in, detaining them for longer than that without a judicial warrant was inappropriate. This bill says that and enforces that judicial ruling. And it also says basically that continue to communicate, but police officers in Illinois to do their job should focus on public safety and well-being while communicating with federal immigration officials. It's reasonable, it's right, and it's a good outcome. I want to thank all of you advocates for justice and human rights and freedom and opportunity. I'd like to thank the business community for advocating for more economic growth, more jobs, more development, and greater prosperity for the people of Illinois. I especially want to thank all of our police officers, all our members in law enforcement. God bless you. We owe you an incredible debt of gratitude. And now it's an honor, it's a privilege for me on behalf of the uh, people of Illinois to sign this important legislation. Thank you. At this You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. Next, from Springfield, we head to the House floor for a debate over Senate Bill 1947, which would reform the state's school funding formula. This runs about 40 minutes. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House. Um, Senate, excuse me, House floor amendment number five to Senate Bill 1947, uh, which becomes the bill, represents a school funding reform agreement between all four legislative leaders and the governor. The amendment contains the provisions of Senate Bill 1 with adjustments um, that I will describe momentarily. Uh, there are no changes to the following items which Republicans had previously requested, so the hold harmless provision is left alone, third party contracting is left alone, inflationary measures that were uh, in SB 1 are left alone, accounting for counting of TIF and PTEL funds within the school funding formula, no changes there, um, no changes to the regionalization factor. In other words, there's no cap on regionalization. Uh, there's no diminishment of collective bargaining rights. Um, CTPF legacy considerations within the formula uh, exist. Uh, CPS block grant considerations are currently within the formula exist. Um, removal of the pension considerations with the formula for the remainder of the districts and removal, excuse me, not removal, but um, the minimum funding level is maintained uh, in floor amendment number five. With regard to changes, and again, let's go through those briefly. 
The minimum funding level is maintained at $350 million, that, but it incorporates a provision that allows for a property tax swap for school districts that are considered to be high wealth, high tax, low wealth districts, excuse me. Um, the CPS normal pension costs will be moved out of the education formula and instead will be provided in the pension code and adjustments to CPS's local resources for the district's unfunded pension costs will be extended to all school districts if they happen to uh, pick up legacy costs as a result of tier three, uh, tier three changes and the districts will receive the same deduction. With regard to mandate relief, there is a streamlined waiver process in which all four of the legislator, legislative leaders will review school district waiver requests. Uh, if three of the leaders flag a proposed waiver, it will go through the current General Assembly waiver process. If a waiver is not flagged by the leaders, then the waiver request is approved. Um, we know that generally the General Assembly approves most if not all waivers, but this will create an expedited process um, that will deal with the vast majority of waiver requests. Um, with regard to physical education, schools will have the ability to reduce daily PE to not less than three days per week. And additionally, individual students in grades seven through 10 will be able to seek an exemption from PE. Currently, that waiver for students exists for grades 11 and 12, and we are extending it all the way down to grade seven. Uh, as far as driver's education is concerned, school districts would be able to use a third party to provide driver's education without going through the waiver process. Other, uh, what we would call non-formula issues, um, property tax referendum, reduction referendum. So therefore, if 10% of registered voters sign a petition, a referendum question can be brought forth at a consolidated election to reduce a school district's educational tax levy by a maximum of 10%. This can only happen if a district is above 110% of adequacy and the levy reduction could not reduce a district's adequacy below the 110%. Uh, if a referendum is brought forth, then the question cannot be posed again for the following two consolidated elections. Um, with regard to the CTPF levy, under current law, the Chicago Board of Education can levy up to 0.383% for teachers' pension costs. This proposal would increase the allowable levy to 0.567% or an additional $120 million if fully realized. Um, a TIF reform commission will be created to study and make recommendations to the General Assembly on, um, on changes to the, uh, to the tax increment financing uh, that happens within municipalities. And then lastly, and I'll be more than happy to take questions after that, there will be a tax credit for scholarship donations. A tax credit would be created to incentivize, don incentivize donations for private school scholarships. Individuals or businesses could receive a 75% tax credit for each dollar donated for which they cannot receive a federal tax deduction. A maximum of 75 million in credits may be awarded annually, and this amount will not increase. If the full 75 million in credits is realized, this program would cover less than approximately 6,000 students, and the program would operate for five years uh, as a pilot program. That being said, Mr. Speaker, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Gentleman moves for the passage of the bill. Without objection, we'll use the five minute timer on each speaker. And the first uh, to speak is Mr. McSweeney for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, will the uh, sponsor yield? Sponsor yields. First, I want to uh, praise you, uh, Chairman Davis, for the work that you've done. You've worked on this for uh, a long time. Uh, and I want to thank you for all your hard work and all the efforts of many people in, in this chamber. But I just have one question, uh, clarification. I just want to uh, confirm on page 546 of amendment number five that the property tax increase authorization is $120 million. I, I understand that's for the pension levy. It's an authorization. Would that raise 120 or $130 million? Um, according to my notes and according to James, $120 million. Great. To the bill, Mr. Speaker, the people of this state are facing a lot of tough times because of these tax increases that have gone into effect recently. They've seen the withholding on their paychecks. They're paying a soda tax in Cook County. They paid their property taxes recently in, in August and September, and we're losing people in this state. So my concern is that we are going to adopt a generational 
change in the way that we appropriate and allocate money, we know that this will cost to meet the standards, adequacy standards about $7.5 billion over the next 10 years at the maximum. It could be a little less than that. I don't know where we're going to get the money. We have $14 billion of unpaid bills. I support the scholarship grant, but that's going to cost $75 million a year. That's $750 million. So what I would prefer is that we actually cut spending to pay for that. I don't know where this money is going to come from. And I say to my friends uh, who represent the great city of Chicago, and by the way, the city of Chicago is a great city. There are a lot of people running around politics criticizing Chicago, uh, but we need to make sure that we're reforming CPS. So I say to my friends, again, uh, who represent the city, can your taxpayers really afford another $130 million property tax increase? Because that's what this is. We can play games with the words and authorization. And I say to my friends on the Republican side, We've had a governor running around for months talking about a bailout, and we're actually going to give Chicago more money. Turns out, a few minutes ago, Frank Clark, the president of the board, said it would be $450 million more for the city of Chicago. So I don't understand, with $580 million more, what CPS is actually going to end up doing with this money uh, to ensure that we put it in the classroom. That's the problem. It's paying for pensions. It's paying for administrative costs. So this is a property tax increase for sure. This is a Chicago big dollar, $450 million increase uh, for sure. And I have other fundamental problems with the bill. This does nothing overall to ensure under the new formula money is spent in the classroom. It does nothing to reduce administrative expenses. It does, doesn't even require a consolidation study by school districts. And the most important part of it is it does not require a cut in property taxes. So while I applaud the work of many uh, I think our leader, Jim Durkin, has done an uh, outstanding job uh, dealing with a very difficult situation uh, because, as we know, this is, this is basically a done deal in the sense that the BIM passed and you know, you're stuck with a formula that's going to cost $7.5 billion over the next 10 years. So I stand for the taxpayers today and say we cannot afford $7.5 billion. We cannot afford more property taxes. I urge a no vote. Mr. Pritchard for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to the bill. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been discussing adequacy and equity in education funding for almost 200 years. You go back to 1818, the delegates at that time were uncertain how we were going to provide for a good education for everyone. And certainly we can all agree that the current formula that we have that has been created since 1997 doesn't give us the kind of equity and adequacy that our children need to become successful in their career and in their lives. So we need to do something different. And what has been put together and is the foundation of this bill is the 27 elements that are proven to be best practices for educating the needs of our students. The formula also comes up with an adequacy target that for the first time tells residents in a school district how much they need to invest to get their students to an adequate level of education and to be successful. Those elements in and of themselves should direct us to say that this is a good model. And when we had difficulty looking at SB1 and other bills that have come before us, we have had partisan discussions about what's the right direction to go. So as we look at 1947 in Amendment 5, we have a bill that has been correct, crafted by our leadership, and by several of us on negotiating committees appointed by the various leaders to try to come up with a bipartisan solution to the many issues we're facing. And by definition, a compromise includes things you like and things you don't like. We've heard some of those, and certainly in the debates from those outside the chamber We've heard about a lot of those issues that some people don't like. But we have to look at what other legislators are looking at to get their support for this bill. And as we look together at the things that 
Representative Davis outlined that are in this bill, we're finding that we're supporting local district choice to use the dollars that we're putting into the system that will move us closer to our constitutional requirement that we pay a majority, the people of Illinois pay a majority of the cost of education. If we follow this model for the next 10 years, which is the model that has been outlined, we will be at that adequacy level of 50%. And that really ought to be a driving force in our decisions on this bill today, is it's moving us to provide the resources that students need. It's moving to deal with the challenges that our school districts have. It allows the school districts the independence to decide what's best for their communities. And it brings us to a better system that is more adequately funded. It provides for some choice in property tax relief. Certainly, it's not as much as some would like. It's more than others would like. It's what you might call a compromise. And certainly as you look at the waivers and the mandates that our side of the aisle has been talking about because our school districts are talking about it, we move in that direction as well. So there are pluses and minus in this bill. And I would just ask is that we really look at how this is going to impact the resources and the education in our district how it's going to move us more towards adequacy and an equal opportunity that builds a more educated workforce that will attract jobs, that will keep jobs in our state, and that will help grow our economy. Because as has been mentioned already, we are heavily taxed in Illinois. It's time to grow the economy, grow the revenues of this state without taking more from the residents that we have. And this bill gives us that opportunity of a better educated workforce, some property tax relief, some benefits that both sides of the aisle have been asking for. So I strongly advocate for a positive vote on this issue. It's going to be game changing and it's going to move Illinois forward. I ask for your support. Representative Davis, I appreciate the work that you've done on this. I know this has been a, a long running issue that your committees have studied. You probably heard more hours of testimony and input into this uh, issue than probably anybody in the General Assembly, and so I commend you for the work that you've been able to do on that. I have a few questions uh, to, to talk about just to look through some of the details and um, some of the aspects of the bill that we're looking at today. The first question is I think it's important that when we're looking at a formula like this that not only drives um, how dollars will be spent in this fiscal year under this uh, appropriation that was passed last month, but also how it will affect districts and education spending in years to come. What kind of uh, adjustment factors or escalators are included in the formula to help make this um, adjust and, and adapt to changing situations in the future? Um, in particular, teacher salaries and support staff salaries. Um, the escalators are designed to realize what the real cost of providing education is, and those escalators are designed to help measure that as a uh, uh, as, as the, as the uh, formula moves forward as we continue to fund the formula. Okay, I appreciate that because it's important that a, that a formula not just work in the time that you've designed it, but also in the future, so I appreciate your perspective on that. Another item that uh, I'm interested in is um, the treatment of uh, property taxes in the city of Chicago. Could you uh, describe for me the um, provisions in this bill that relate to property taxes for individuals and commercial ins institutions in the city of Chicago? What it does is that it authorizes um, the Chicago Board, Board of Education, to potentially raise the a levy that's available for them to make payments toward their own pension system. And, and what's, the, what's the, um, the provision in place for that? Is it simply a vote of the board? Is it a referendum that has to be approved by the city council or by voters? Or what, what are the steps in place to make that happen? It is a vote of the Chicago Board of Education that allows for, for that to happen. Okay. In um, a couple other aspects of the bill that are that were interesting to me, I had the uh, pleasure of serving with the lieutenant governor on a commission that looked at unfunded mandates uh, and local government consolidation. I noticed there are some um, provisions in this bill that address mandates. Um, 
where did those uh, ideas for mandate relief come from, or why is why is mandate relief an important part of a school funding proposal? Well, presumably, mandate relief is important because school districts would like to res like to have some kind of flexibility, maybe also a way to kind of measure or be able to control some of their costs uh, as appropriate. During the conversation, essentially two mandates always consistently came up in the conversation, and that was involving uh, PE and driver's ed. And thanks to a conversation that I had with Representative Pritchard, another part of this conversation is a, is a streamlined process. We know that the current process is very cumbersome. It takes a long time. So this allows for some waivers to be addressed in a more efficient manner when there can be agreement based on the four leaders. And when there's not, we still have the same process that allows for a more uh, lengthier, more enhanced debate on, uh, on approving that waiver if it is so desired. Uh, so I appreciate that, but specifically on the mandates that are being relieved, the first would be that it would, this would allow a school district to contract with a commercial driving instructor and driver's education. Uh, currently, there is, that has to go through a waiver process, and even before it's streamlined, it has to go through the waiver process. What this bill would provide is that driver's education could be commercially contracted without going through the waiver process. Is that right? Okay. That is correct. And uh, then the second uh, mandate that's being relieved is uh, on the physical education mandate. And uh, is it true that this would reduce the number of days that are required, or, or how does this uh, provide relief in PE? Well, currently the mandate is five days. This reduces it to three days uh, a week, but then it also has a provision for individual students where they can petition to get out of PE if they're currently involved in some type of extracurricular activity. So we're pretty familiar with the waiver process in the General Assembly. We usually have that bill that comes up that's a, kind of a confusing report about accept the waivers, don't accept the waivers uh, that are re recommended by ISBE. Uh, so tell me a little bit, you mentioned that this streamlines the waiver process. How do we, how do we kind of cut out some of that red tape for school districts? Well, it allows for the leaders to be able to review all the mandates, and if there's an agreement amongst at least three of the leaders, that mandate can be relieved. If there's not an agreement, we still have the process and allows the waivers to move through the process. So this is a, a quicker way to do that versus the way we're currently doing. The last question I have is about the property tax um, relief referendum. Uh, what school districts would be eligible to pursue property tax relief under this bill? Uh, districts that are currently above 110% of adequacy. And that would happen each year. If a school district went above 110% of adequacy, they'd be eligible to, um, to take uh, advantage of this property tax relief opportunity? They will be able to re reduce by 10%, and right now that currently affects about 100 districts. Uh, thank you, Representative, for your comments to the bill. Uh, I'd like to uh, commend all the, the workers uh, from both caucuses, from both chambers, um, who have spent so many hours trying to put together what I think is a, is a reasonable compromise here. Um, as many other speakers have indicated, there's never an ability in a compromise for one side to say they got everything they were looking for. Sometimes uh, an issue that you wanted to have addressed wasn't addressed. Sometimes things don't go far enough. Sometimes they go too far. Uh, the nature of legislation that we have uh, in, the, in this uh, General Assembly is that many times we're forced to make a decision based on a product uh, that's happened given the input of all 118 members of those people who have negotiated it in a more direct uh, way. They're the ones who are at the tables um, trying to come up with an agreement that they think can pass with support from both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I'd like to, to commend uh, the representatives on both sides who have worked in this issue. I think we have a fair compromise here. Again, it doesn't do everything that we're looking for it to do, but I think it's a step in the right direction, and I encourage support for this measure. Thank you. Mr. Reich for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to the bill. I've been listening to my friends from the other side talk about this bill, and I find it highly ironic that they've got a bill that gives them 90% of what they want, but they're still not in favor of it. I'm not in favor of this bill as it's written either. There's a lot of stuff in there I do not like. I don't like the idea of legacy costs being used to reduce local capacity, which will give the city of Chicago's public school system an additional $40 million a year. I don't like that. I don't like, honestly, I don't like the uh, tax credit program because I believe if we're going to if we're going to provide for school choice in this state, and there is no bigger advocate for school choice in this state than I am, I believe that we ought to stand up and give school choice out of money that we have appropriated here. 
to blow a $75 million hole in the budget immediately upon passage of a budget that has cost many people their careers, I cannot support that. I would much rather see something done that is being done like in Arizona and Nevada where parents are given the state appropriated money and told, go educate your kid the best way you think. However, now to the bill. There are things in the bill that I think move us forward. The first one is the property tax swap. It's small, it's inadequate, but it's going to give districts, especially in the south suburbs, Waukegan, Zion, it's going to give them a taste of what it's like to have a property tax bill that is actually going down a cut. At the expense of state money, yes, but that's something we're going to have to deal with because property taxes are completely out of control. This is a, this is a beginning step, and I, and I to, the, to, to Representative Davis specifically, I will say this. I think when the districts that are in your district start to see the benefits of this, they're going to come clamoring to you for further relief in that regard, and I will fully support them, and I will support you as you come to us and say, let's do this. The ability of the, to, the, the, the authorization to the city of Chicago to blow through its PTEL limit, in effect, to get more money from its property tax owner, uh, its property taxpayers to pay for its own pension plan. I think that's a good move because I think that what we're doing now is we've stuck the camel's nose under the tent flap with regard to how property taxes should be assessed in this state and what limitations should or should not be placed upon them. I don't agree with a lot of the things in this bill, believe me. I, I spent all weekend agonizing over this. Um, but on overall, it's a bailout for the city of Chicago, yes. You're getting money that it, other districts are not going to get, yes. But your pensions are now going to be paid for in the pension code where it belongs. And the day is going to come when we're going to do a pension swap, a pension shift. And the Chicago public school system is going to go to its, its, the Chicago Teachers Union instead of, and say instead of spending 2% two, uh, 2 of your salary toward pensions, you're now going to have to pay the same way everybody else does in this state. And that's 9%. And they're not going to like it. But you know something? That's too damn bad. It's time that we started treating pensioners employees who are on public pensions the same regardless of their zip code. So overall, this is not a good bill. This was not a good bill when it came back here as Senate Bill 1. I didn't like the, I didn't like the formula, the funding model to begin with. I don't. I think we can do this better. But this is the bill we're going to have. And we're not going to, if we blow this up, if we blow this up and Senate Bill 1 goes down and everything else goes to hell in a handbasket, we're going we're gonna to have to go back and renegotiate this. And I do not have any confidence that we're going to get a better bill than we have right now. Therefore, I reluctantly will hold my nose and vote for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When I said earlier we only had two speakers, I did not see Mr. Wheeler's light. So Mr. Wheeler, for five minutes, will be the last speaker on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the sponsor yield? Sponsor yields. Well, I want to thank you. You know, I had some discussions online, offline about this issue. The last two times I spoke on this floor, I implored us as a body to work together, to not just continue to build pressure, but rather build consensus. In some form, I think this has, what this particular bill in front of us has done and taken that shape. So with that, I want to ask you just a few questions so I have some clarity about how this works and the role that I might ultimately play in it. There are some questions about transparency regarding the tax credit for the scholarships. Can you answer a couple questions for me, please? Please, go right ahead. So one thing that was brought up was where this money goes and how do we ever track it? Don't the, 
The SGOs have a role to play in that as far as reporting and how that works within ISBE and, and the Department of Revenue. Can you walk me through how that you intend that to work? Well, the SGOs actually will administer the program. I believe they will be the repositories of the resources, uh, but they can only do that once they have been vetted by initially the uh, Department of Revenue to make sure that they are an organization in good standing, uh, that they are not for profit, that their board members don't have any other particular conflict. So there is a high level of scrutiny that will come along uh, with this because I would argue that advocates want to make sure that the dollars are going to be administered appropriately. Thank you. Would, would there be a, then a, based on the, what's in the, the bill and what ultimately could become statute, would, be a, would they go through JCAR then for some rules that administer exactly how those procedures would be followed within the, the, the uh, agencies and such? Oh, I would imagine the, the rules committee, or excuse me, the JCAR, Joint Committee on Administrative Rules, will have a significant role in working to try to determine exactly how this process will work. And they would have to move rel relatively quickly in order for us to have this in place by the time we want to see these scholarships being administered and to have those who are going to invest in these programs know that, they're, that their money is going to get the tax credits properly mm -hmm. and that this process runs smoothly and effectively, but with some level of transparency. Well, certainly, that's what, you know, JCAR will, will do for us. Now, mind you, this will not start until the next school year, so 2018-19 school year, and I'm not saying that there is a ton of time, but there certainly is adequate time for, for the JCAR to come together to make sure that the rules are appropriate and adequate for this program. Well, I only say it because I know my friend Leader Lang does not favor emergency rules, and we want to do the rule process properly. So I'm just making sure it's on the record that we intend to move this quickly, so that it has a chance to take form when it should take form, if you'll understand before this begins. So there is a level of transparency that people are concerned about. I understand that part of it. I agree with that. Uh, Representative, is there also, is this, does this scholarship program require any kind of results as far as what is being done with the money and, and who gets it and what they do with that money and what those, the, the achievements of, the, of those students? Well, at, at the very least, um, the students that participate in the program will be subject to taking, um, be subject to state standards. Uh, and so we will be monitoring state standards um, with regard to these students as, as compared to students in any other other public schools um, that are here in the state of Illinois as well. So you have at least that much in terms of, of scrutiny and, and monitoring that will, that will take place. Okay, I think in my analysis that showed that that's a breakthrough. That's something that's not normally required in, in private education. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. Thank you. With respect to the scholarship, the, the, the students who get to receive the scholarships, we're trying to drive these opportunities for kids who are part of potentially low-income families. That's what this is all about. There's no, this is not going to go to any high-profile, you know, high-income families, you know, that we hear about all the time that go to private school. This is a different model, right? This is going to go for low-income kids that need this kind of help these, to get this opportunity, I should say. Yes, not only um, are there income requirements, but students who are in what would otherwise be classified as failing schools will also be eligible for participation as well. So that's still in line with the thinking behind what this evidence-based model is supposed to help us do, right? It's supposed to help us drive money toward districts that have you know, low-income concentrations. This is also another way to help low-income families. And kind of in concert together, we're doing the best we can as a state to move the ball forward for those low-income families. Is that a, a fair and accurate representation? It is. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate your answers to the questions to the bill. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a rare opportunity in my tenure here for us to actually look at what we could call a bipartisan success. We haven't done a lot of that lately. It's time for us to step up, help our kids, help our teachers, administrators, families, and get something done for Illinois. Thank you. Mr. Davis to close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Before I get into any final comments, um, let me take this opportunity to thank a number of individuals and groups that participated in ultimately getting to where we are, particularly as it relates to uh, starting with SB1 that would include organizations like the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, the Illinois Association of School Business Officials, uh, Stand for Children um, was a, a very important organization relative to this discussion, um, as well as Advance Illinois. Um, I also want to make sure I acknowledge particularly two members of our staff that were very uh, instrumental in managing this process and the conference calls and all the information 
and that is, of course, Jessica Basham, our director um, of appropriations, but more importantly, the young man standing behind me to my right, Mr. James O'Brien, who has certainly proven himself to be one of the standout members of our staff here on this side, deserves a great round of applause for everything that he's done. Um, there are a number of members that were a part of this process and, and going back to our negotiating, uh, negotiate, initial nego negotiating team that includes members from both sides and both chambers, particularly Senators Barrickman and McConkie, um, Senator Lightford, Senator Menard, especially Senator Menard, who's been shepherding this process for the last two, three, four years, who, who really got the ball rolling on getting us down this path. Uh, here in the House, of course, uh, along with myself, you have uh, our leader, Leader Curry, um, Representative Bourne was a part of that, but I'd be remiss if I really didn't take an opportunity to acknowledge again Representative Bob Pritchard, who has been a real stalwart in trying to get um, the right thing done here in the state of Illinois as it relates to school funding and all of his work. Um, the streamlined waiver process was his brainchild, and we were able to at least get that as part of the, uh, a part of the final, final deal. And when all else fails, of course, we have to thank our leaders that work together on this bill, the compromise, however you feel about it. Again, that's what sometimes it is, and we've acknowledged already that sometimes compromise is when nobody necessarily walks away with everything that they want, be it 90% or otherwise. And um, we've heard back and forth about how members feel about certain parts uh, of this compromise. And again, you'll have to vote how you feel you should vote with regard to this. So again, our primary objective here is to make sure that we do something different here in the state of Illinois. One member who pointed to a, a number of South Suburban schools and talked about how much money they're spending and uh, their tax rates. Well, unfortunately, they don't have the benefit of the area that she has. If they were in her area, they wouldn't be spending nearly as much money. So I don't know how you, how you chastise these districts for doing everything that they can do when you're in a district that has plenty of wealth, plenty of business, and plenty of money in order to spend on school districts. So let's, let's not get too far off base with why this is important. We have talked for a very long time about an evidence-based way of funding schools here in Illinois. So members talked about transparency. The evidence-based model is transparency, ladies and gentlemen. It creates a mechanism where we can track all of the dollars that are going to school districts to make sure that at the end of the day that their outcomes are being measured up against the amount of resources that they receive. That's what an evidence-based model is, and that's what it does, and we are proud to have put that forward. Let's take the vote. On this question, there are 46 voting yes, 61 voting no, five voting present and the bill fails. Ladies and gentlemen, the Republicans will go to caucus in room 118 immediately. Democrats will go to caucus in room 114 immediately. The House of Representatives will be in recess to the call of the chair. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. Next, from Springfield, Senate President John Cullerton holds a press conference to discuss the passage of SB 1947. This runs about 10 minutes. Um, so I'm very happy that we were able to pass this bill today in a bipartisan fashion. The, uh, the fact is that um, uh, I recognized the talent of Senator Menard when I asked him to be my chief of staff um, back in 2009. He's been working on this school funding reform uh, project for many years. <clears throat> and it's incredibly complicated and very complicated both legislatively as well as politically. Um, I'm also very happy that uh, the concept of uh, treating Chicago fairly, like the rest of the state, with regard to their pensions is another major accomplishment with the passage of this bill today, in addition, obviously, to the fact that we now can um, get this bill to the governor as soon as possible, have him sign it, and, and get money to the schools. Um, this does represent a major compromise. 
Uh, in the past, Senator Menard's efforts were to take the $7 billion that we uh, used to fund our schools and to run it through a new formula. Um, and instead, what we did was we compromised and we let the school districts keep what they have this year. But the big accomplishment is that we are ending the worst in the nation funding formula going forward. We're starting off with $350 million this year. Um, we actually had to pass that budget first, really, before we could pass this bill. And that budget enabled us to pass this bill because uh, people knew the money had already been appropriated. And now the question was where, where would we distribute it? From my perspective and the, the schools that are in my district, we have um, uh, remarkable schools on the north side of Chicago. People have changed their, their uh, habits dramatically over the past 20 years. Folks used to leave Chicago to go to the suburbs because of the schools. Instead, now they're staying and improving their own schools. Uh, and yet there was always this question as to whether or not they're going to have enough money. Uh, this bill uh, would allow for Chicago to get pension parity, about $220 million uh, this year. It allows for them to get, under the school funding formula, about 19% of the monies, the new monies, of that $350 million, which is about their population. It acknowledges the fact that Chicago still remains uh, obligated to pay for its legacy cost, for the catching up, if you will, for falling behind, just like the state has fallen behind for the teacher's retirement system. And so, um, and there's been a request uh, from f folks throughout the state, actually, to, to say that Chicago is not paying its fair share in the area of property taxes. So we gave the school board the opportunity, if they wish, to enact it to... Um, to raise money so that the city of Chicago um, would be able to receive as much as $425, $430 million, which should be enough, hopefully, to allow them to close their, their gap, not only this year but going forward. And there's certainty now. There, there will be a minimum funding level in this piece of legislation that uh, will inform us every year we want to try to raise the appropriation for education. Uh, which has been done in the past, but in various little buckets. Now it's in one bucket uh, with a unified formula. So it's really, really uh, a big deal. And it's, uh, quite frankly, been improved as a result of um, ne these negotiations. Um, uh, the, um, in, in the course of these negotiations, there was a request for property tax changes, specifically from... Republicans in areas where there's um, uh, high property taxes, but also a lot of money spent on their schools. And so this gives the people who've been complaining about high property taxes the opportunity to vote on whether or not they want to actually reduce their property taxes in those schools. But it's limited to those schools that are performing uh, or, or spending over 110% of their adequacy level. Um, there's been concessions that were made with regard to mandates that would help alleviate the cost of running our schools. These are things which we in the Senate, the Democrats, offered back in January as part of our grand bargain. And so those have also been incorporated. Um, it's unfortunate it took us this long to get to this point. I would have preferred that these new items, like the, the scholarship program, um, be vetted in public. They were vetted in the negotiation process. There were many, many different elements of this proposal from the advocates for it uh, who started off who had to take and make a number of sacrifices themselves. But obviously it was a critical part because Senate Bill 1 itself, um, actually a new and improved version of Senate Bill 1 is passed today along with these extra provisions that, again, we, we probably could have done this uh, months ago. But in either case, we're here, <clears throat> and um, we've passed it, uh, and I'm very uh, proud of the uh, work that the, the Senate did. I also want to congratulate Senator Brady on his uh, uh, 
nomination by his party, by his own caucus, to be their leader in our uh, election of Senator Brady today. And the word that he uses is the word that every leader uses once they get elected, and that's humbled. So um, I was happy to hear him say that. I didn't feed that to him, I was, but I heard that, and I said, that sounds very familiar. So any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Mr. President, winner on this. I mean, the, the Democrats get to claim the big victories, the governor get to claim? Yeah, well, when you have a compromise, everybody has to claim a big victory or that you don't get the votes for it, including the governor who has to sign it. And he's indicated that he's going to do that. Governor came on the floor today, and I was happy to see him wearing a tie, which is part of the Senate rules. Uh, I heard he had to put a tie on, but um, it was good to see him on the floor and uh, congratulating us for uh, passing the bill. Well, what changed in the last couple of weeks to, to get the governor's support? It seems that there's a whole lot in this package that reflected his inventory before what he initially said he wanted to happen with it. Maybe I'll ask that. Ask, maybe I'll answer that question after he signs it. Is the muscle memory in place now? Is compromise in the future going to be an easier thing to achieve? Well, um, I hope so, because as you know, I started off the year with Senator Redonio um, uh, before the year started trying to do a grant compromise, grand bargain, and so um, which I believe, uh, I think people would say fairly, did lead to. Uh, eventually getting a, uh, a budget, which ended up being a bipartisan bill. So, yes, I hope so. I don't think we need, even with an election year next year, to have these fights. We, we, should, we should pass a budget next year without uh, extraneous issues. People can consider an election year the merits of the people who are running. We'll have had a primary. We'll know who the candidates are. Um, and we should focus on funding education. We have revenue in place. Uh, we have a lot of old bills that um, need to be paid down. There's no, there's some provisions that would allow for some of those to be paid down, but so that's going to be a big issue next year. But hopefully we can, we can do it in a calm way, uh, straightforward way. Do it before uh, we go into overtime session, and um, then let the people decide who they want to have as their governor next year. Mr. President, on the scholarship piece of it, you could say. You know, I don't really like it that much, but I'm going to vote for the bill because it's the right thing to do. Where you could say, by golly, that's the camel's nose under the slippery slope, and there's no way I can vote for it because only worse stuff is going to follow. Why is voting for the bill the right thing to do uh, based on uh, that spectrum of thoughts on the scholarship? Piece? Well, I think the problem is that, uh, that it wasn't uh, because of the process. We didn't have time to... Uh, have public hearings and have people understand what was in the bill. Even our own members had to learn about it for some, in some cases for the first time. We had a long caucus mainly just to understand the provisions. Now, I understood them, negotiating it. But, and we would have liked to have taken more time, but you, you know that would mean that we would all that time be delaying getting the money out to the schools. And so um, it really was more of a process problem. Um, we're going to have, you know, we're still going to be in the, in session. If people want to put bills in to modify this or eliminate this uh, scholarship program, they're, we're, we're open for business, and I'm sure that there will be many ideas advanced. But uh, in the big picture, in the big picture, um, it, that's a relatively small part of this bill. That's going to affect maybe 7,500 kids a year. The, the, we have 2 million public school children. In the, in the state of Illinois. And so uh, this is a major accomplishment. Not, again, not what Senator Menard and I had hoped to, to pass you know, years ago. Uh, we would have liked to have run $7 million through a new formula. But the main thing is, uh, in retrospect, it was necessary to compromise to get suburban votes, to get the governor to agree, and therefore it's a major accomplishment. This is one of our creative uses of uh, legislative mud wrestling, you might say, with what we've seen over the last how, how do you assess the fact that the Senate overrode the governor's veto of SB1? What role did that play in getting the governor and the Republicans to come to the table and form? Yeah, so obviously um, that put pressure on the House. And I'm sure that part of the consideration and negotiations were the possibility of the House overruling the governor as well. And so that, that played a role, and I think that was a important contribution to arriving at this fair conclusion. President, you're a Chicago resident. Obviously, Illinois residents overall are paying more in taxes with the income tax increase and now this property tax increase. Can you speak to 
what you're going to tell constituents about that or why that's justified? Yeah. You know, it's f interesting that in my district, the, the, the pressure that I get are from the, the most vocal constituents are the ones who are the, uh, the parents of students in those public schools. And uh, they know that that money's going, in, in effect, going into those schools and keeping those schools open, which has been so vital, not just to, the, to them and their, and their, their, their children, but the, the Lakeview Chamber of Commerce is talking about how well things are going because of the success of the school. So uh, I know it's a citywide tax. I know people don't like taxes, obviously, and especially property taxes. Um, but um, when people know where the money's going and they think it's going for a good product, it's more acceptable, and I think that's what we have done here. And I, I don't know if it's true or not, but the folks in the suburbs always say that Chicago hasn't done its fair share. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's that's why there's political support for what we have done. Next, from Springfield, we'll hear from Democrat State Senators Andy Menar and Kimberly Lightford as they discuss the passage of SB 1947. This runs about 10 minutes. Senator Lightford and I want to make ourselves available uh, to not just talk about what just took place on the uh, Senate floor um, and the historic nature of what was accomplished today, but also be available to answer any questions about specifics in the bill. Um, first, let me say this. Uh, this has been a long and cumbersome process, um, but that process started long before I was elected to the Senate. It was a process that has consumed decades of work that has been waged by many uh, members of both the House and the Senate on both sides of the aisle. Um, all along the way, especially toward the end of uh, this debate, uh, we knew that this was a moment that we had to uh, grab and not let go of. So today's vote is a culmination of efforts of uh, monumental proportion on the part of both Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate and I think that should be underscored today. Uh, we've been grappling with this for decades in Illinois. Uh, we know that by almost every metric, we are the worst in the country when it comes to equitable funding and adequate levels of funding for uh, most school districts in the state, not all, but most. Uh, if we stick to this plan, and if we stay on the path that, that we just adopted and we presume the governor's going to sign, uh, we will lead the pack towards equity. Uh, we won't be last. Uh, we will begin to move forward. And that just isn't important because it's an important metric. It's important because it affects the lives of children in communities that haven't been served well by the state of Illinois and by a broken system of school funding. You know, I, I could have told probably 100 stories along uh, of what's happened along the way uh, during the debate in the Senate and um, I want to I want to say this: uh, We uh, voted. If you go back to the debate on the resolution uh, that we co-sponsored uh, back in 2013, uh, there were people on the floor of the Senate, and there were people outside of the Senate chamber, um, individuals that follow education funding, that advocate for education issues, that said, um, and you know they said this: that this is not something that can be accomplished. Um, all along the way. There were individuals and groups and organizations that fought to preserve the status quo because they benefit from the status quo. There were naysayers, there were roadblocks, there were hurdles, and that took time and it took a tremendous effort that uh, spans every corner of the state that we live in. Uh, but we got the ball to the finish line uh, today. And that was because of a bipartisan effort during a time when we've seen uh, hyperpartisanship in Springfield. Uh, so I'm proud of that effort. I'm proud of the effort of the thousands, thousands of people across the state uh, that built a grassroots network of advocacy uh, to make this achievement possible today uh, in the Illinois Senate. And I want to thank each of them uh, because their efforts will undoubtedly change the lives of children, uh, more specifically, their efforts will change the lives of children that live in poverty. And that was our number one goal, was to change the system so that we can have um, a positive impact on kids no matter where they live. Senator Lightford. 
Thank you, Senator. So this is what compromise looks like. Um, us getting to a place where um, just a bill that no one loved um, at 100 percent. And through the years, this is exactly where we would fall through the cracks. Um, if you guys remember, been around long enough, Senator Meeks had Senate Bill 750 for a very long time. And there was other efforts along the way, as I could date back to Senator Art Berman and Senator Vince DiMuzio. Um, those guys had different ideas on how to solve this huge problem. But speaking of those gentlemen, it's been decades since, and we've lost generations. Uh, we've lost children who were poverty stricken. Uh, we've lost children who were downstate Illinois and who also needed more than just transportation dollars. And so I'm really just um, grateful to be on this journey uh, with Senator Menar and all of the other members who finally came to a place of compromise and negotiation enough to know that the children are, are first. They're, they're the priority. Um, they're what's most important. And um, I believe this is a measure that shows that uh, it reflects a new system um, of evidence-based modeling that would allow these 27 elements to uh, really enact need where need should be. Um, and that's been a challenge over the years. It just seems we would have this budget and then we would have to fight over the last funding to see where it goes and who gets what, if it's in categoricals, <laughs> if it's transportation, if it's poverty. So I'm really glad that we now have a system that will have this fair distribution based on need, and then the fight is over where the dollars will go. Um, I think now moving forward, the efforts will be getting as much resources into the funding formula as possible so that it can yield the results that we're hoping for uh, through the years. So again, I, I just think that this is a measure that, um, as you can see from the vote, um, was something that um, took a lot of work from um, both sides of the aisles to come up with uh, an agreement. Um, the, the pitfall, I believe, on the Democrat side of this wonderful historic uh, moment for many members who wanted to vote yes was the um, program that was put on the table at the last minute uh, for the vouchers, for the private vouchers that I spoke uh, about on the floor a couple weeks back. Um, I think that it's a national movement of the Republican Party to take public funds away and put it in private schools. Um, I am an advocate for all kids learning and all across the state. Need it be Chicago, suburban, downstate. I'm just an advocate for that. And some kids learn in different settings. I just hope that this program doesn't get us to a place where funds that are desperately needed in the public school system is being put into a, a private system that's not only focused on just uh, kids that are at 185% poverty, but at 300% and 400% for returning uh, families. So that's a family of four able to have an income of almost $100,000 a year. That is in poverty uh, in the state of Illinois. That's not what poverty looks like. So I just hope we don't move into this vein where we want to begin sending middle class kids to a free private education. Other than that, I believe that it would have been um, much more support um, from um, the Democrat caucus because we've worked so hard on this issue. Uh, we've spearheaded this issue, kept it alive, kept it moving all along with the leadership of Senator Menard. So thanks again, Senator, for all your hard work. And I'm really glad he came over from staff to the Senate side as one of us. Thanks, Senator. I'm not sure my wife is. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Moving forward, how do you ensure that enough money continues to be yeah. What is it going to look like next year when we're talking about the budget and we're trying to get money set aside? Well, um, for FY18, uh, uh, that money is budgeted in full. So uh, this bill completes that budgetary process for us. Uh, so uh, not only does the budget that was passed by the legislature and paid for by the legislature uh, fund this piece of uh, the bill that we just passed, it also gets school districts caught up. Uh, we would encourage the governor to go through that process right now. Um, so if you look at recent years, um, th this was a question in our caucus, actually, and it's a fair question. Um, what we're expecting 
uh, following uh, the adoption of the evidence-based model isn't too different from the most recent five fiscal years in terms of how much money is being spent on public schools. Uh, the difference is we're just all putting it into one place now. So the senator rightfully described the process in past years where certain types of school districts will come here and advocate for one uh, program, one silo of money in the State Board of Education's budget. Another type of school district, downstate school districts, would say, well, we want that dollar, that limited dollar to go to transportation. Suburban districts want that limited dollar to go to special education. Um, and they were, they were looking at that process of distribution and advocating for the thing that benefited them the most. Um, all the while, the, the state as a whole grew less equitable. So the difference here is uh, we should spend uh, a minimum amount of $350 million, which is our march toward adequacy and equity for all of the state, not just Chicago. Um, you know, there's much attention about Chicago public schools, which should not be lost in this debate, and I said it during my closing statement, is what this bill does for small rural school districts in downstate Illinois. The most profound piece of legislation to ever hit a governor's desk for downstate education is this bill, without question. So we need to continue to invest what we have. The difference here um, is where is it going to go and what is the outcome going to be? So we've spent almost that amount, Monique, in recent years. We just kind of peppered around to different things to appease constituencies. This time, moving forward, the constituency is adequacy and equity for everybody. Next, from Springfield, we get the GOP response from State Senators Jason Barrickman and Sue Rezin to the passage of SB 1947. This runs about 10 minutes. Okay, so good afternoon. Nice to see everybody. Smiling faces these days. Um, Jason Barrickman uh, from, from uh, Bloomington uh, here with Senator McConkie and Senator Rezin. I think um, just to kind of open this up briefly, you know, obviously uh, there's a culmination of, of years of hard work here. And uh, I think it's important that we've come to this historic moment. You know, you think about the, the history of this, Senator Rezin, uh, who's a member of EFAC, which I think we're, you know, how many years ago uh, that that process really kicked this off. Uh, Senator McConkie, who was involved in the negotiations that really played out over this summer. Um, Truly, I think, a, a historic moment for Illinois, for our schools, and most importantly, for our school children. Um, think, you just think of all the things that have happened over, over this, you know, these many years. Uh, literally, uh, two Star Wars movies, uh, the Hawks and the Cubs won world championships. We added a baby to the mix. Uh, so this is a long time coming. Uh, we cannot stress the importance uh, that our caucus has felt in coming to uh, this bipartisan agreement. Uh, clearly important for uh, schools right now, but even uh, beyond that, the importance of fixing the formula, of ending the devastating effects of proration, of um, assuring that school children are going to have an opportunity to receive the resources that they need to, uh, to experience a high-valued education. Uh, and in this time of state government where I think people around the state are wondering whether the two sides can come together in agreement, I think this is a unique opportunity for us to demonstrate the ability to come together in a divided government in a manner that moves our state forward. So I was glad to be a, a part of that process. I think there's many, many people who uh, had their fingers rightfully so in the pot to get this done. And I think it's, uh, it's a fantastic moment that we have, um, that we were able to get this passed in the Senate. So with that, I'll turn it over to either Senator Rezin. Sure. Or, sure. I'll add a couple things. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity, obviously, to be here as well. You know, this is a topic that we've talked about and discussed and debated um, for the last four years on both sides, all four caucuses. 
And we talked about so many different topics in the hundreds of hours that we spent in both education funding committees. Some of the issues that we talked about we agree with, some gives us heartburn. But that's how you get to this end result which we saw today. When we're moving major public policy like you saw today, um, with the passing of an education funding formula after several decades under the old formula, and you're mo moving funding um, a major policy like this, you have to bring people along. And, you know, nothing's ever going to be perfect. However, there were enough good things in the bill that after all of the debates, after all of the battles on the floor that you saw, got us to this point. So I know through this entire process that there were many people that just kind of threw their arms up and said, we don't know what's going on. All they do is fight about the education funding formula. It was important that we did because we all represent different districts. I represent a downstate rural district that has immediately been impacted by the prorationing of the past years. My colleagues that spoke before you um, Senator Lightford, who I work with well with, but she represents an area that, although I try to understand her area, it's not reflective of my area. So it's important that we have these battles, these arguments on the floor to get us to the position that we are today. So I am excited to see this. I believe that this is a historic um, movement forward for education funding and, um, you know, look forward to the changes I know that I will see in my district as well. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dan McConkie, just briefly, I want to point out the fact that during the iterations that we saw of school funding over the years, one of the things that uh, we finally got to the point of is that something that the education community uh, was very strong on was no red numbers. Every previous piece of legislation over the years had school districts in suburbs and downstate, many, many, many places, losing money. And this is the first time that we came to an agreement, a bipartisan agreement, and really a linchpin to that was a hold harmless that ensured that no school district was you know, lost money. The, the mantra I kept hearing was no red numbers, and that ended up being the case at the end of the day with this, along with very, some other very important pieces, some things that I think are good for suburban districts as well as downstate districts and as well as for the city. Um, I think we've been able to, through this process, to move beyond regionalism uh, to something that I think is substantive and is good for all students across the state. And I think with that, we'll take any questions you might have. The campaign to kill the tax credits for private schools uh, donors is already underway before the bill is even a part of law. How do you safeguard against this pilot program from being kicked to the curb? Well, I think the, the value of the program is going to be evident by what it accomplishes in this initial five-year plan. Uh, obviously, the advocates uh, who really represent students around the state, represent the needs of students around the state that are not being fulfilled today, I think the advocates are going to have an opportunity to demonstrate why this program is important and necessary uh, as it's implemented and utilized in these coming years. There, there are some concerns from those in the private school community, some parents even who send their kids to private school, and, and, and they're nervous today because they're now hearing that state dollars are somehow going to go toward private schools. They're worried about regulation. We're hearing so. What would you say to their kids to uh, private schools if they're going to apply for these scholarships? Are there going to be any strings attached to the state regulation? I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of misconceptions about what exists in this legislation. One of the most significant being where state dollars are being applied. The reality is there's no state dollars that are being utilized through this program for these non-public schools. And so any characterization of that, I think, is a, is a fallacy. And one of the first things that we all need to do is educate the public on what this program is. Obviously, again, we'll look to the advocates to help in, in uh, promoting it. Um, but having the, having the public come to terms with what exactly this is is, I think, step one. Who, who gets the credit for this uh, program? Who brought it up? Well, I think there's a lot of credit that goes into the entirety of this legislation. There's, there's no one person for whom anyone can look at as being uh, solely determinative. Ultimately, what you see is, the, is the, uh, the, the work product of Republicans and Democrats working with the governor 
and coming together in a bipartisan manner to, to um, effectively incorporate lots of people's ideas and inputs in a manner that allowed us to get this done. Senator, you've got, you and uh, Annie Menards were the point people, let's say, didn't, were key to some of this. What would you say were the key concessions the Republican side of the aisle got? And at the end of the day, how will this legislation change education in Illinois? I mean, what would you expect to see three and five years from now as far as any improvements in the schools? So I, I think very uh, key components here, and, and Senator McConkey alluded to this previously, the years that have gone into today's legislation include multiple proposals that were designed to redistribute money from dis one district to another. The, re the end result being uh, oftentimes hundreds of school districts who would effectively lose money. To Republicans, that was a non-starter. We raised that issue uh, early on uh, in prior years. There's, you know, Twitter accounts now saying the hashtag no red numbers, advocating for uh, the legislation that was passed today. So I think the notion that we've removed this redistribution um, is, a, is a very big win that is, that is a result of Republican advocacy. I think that blending the school code and the pension code or Chicago's pensions within the school funding formula, uh, I think that's very bad public policy. Quite frankly, I was very surprised that the advocates were willing to do that because of the long-term effect that that would have, whatever side of the coin one may fall on and whether it's right or wrong for Chicago's pensions to be paid by the state. Uh, there's, there's no good public policy component to embedding sh Chicago's pensions into the school funding formula and in, a man and in a manner that is inconsistent with the way in which we treat the other state pension funds. So with this negotiation, we, we removed that normal pension cost. I think that's very significant and positive. Uh, and then, you know, the, the evidence-based model, I'm, I'm a downstater, and I believe this stuff. I believe that the evidence-based funding model is good public policy. I believed that back in 2014 when I first started studying it, read the Michelle Mangan report and the various um, white papers and nuts and bolts of this thing. There was a lot of advocacy uh, done back then to encourage support on the evidence model. Quite frankly, none of us had heard of it at the time. Fast forward to today, I think uh, school districts around the state, and again, those, the school children around the state, are going to be the, the biggest beneficiaries of this evidence-based funding model. And that came about uh, through Republican advocacy over the years, quite frankly. So, uh, so I think those are monumental. There's also a component of this that is raw politics, which is, you know, it's a math game. How do you, for off, for, you know, in the spring session, it was about how do you get to 30, 60 and a signature from the governor? Um, I'm not sure that all sides would believe, would characterize the negotiations then as being in good faith. We were very frustrated as Republicans then. Um, but the math problem that we had this summer was how do you get to 36, 71 and a signature from the governor? The, the work product that's in this legislation gave us that path. And I think there were votes put on uh, today's legislation that were solely a result of the components that were pieced together to accommodate a supermajority vote in both chambers. Next, from Springfield, we first talked to GOP state reps Jeannie Ives and David McSweeney, who were opposed to SB 1947 after the original House vote failed. We'll then talk to education executives Michael Jacoby and Dr. Brent Clark, and later State Representative Will Davis, who all support SB 1947, after the bill passed the House on the second vote. This runs about 30 minutes. Representative Ginny Ice, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Uh, the House vote just was happening uh, on SB 1947, which was the most recent version of the educational funding rewrite. Yes. How did you vote, and why did you vote that way? 
I voted no, and I've been a no on this uh, because I don't like the evidence-based model. It's failed in other states. It's, a, it's taken billions of dollars in taxpayer money, funneled into schools based on the ideal school, and it's all been input-based and out, uh, outcome-based. And I knew that this was junk science from the get-go. And in our case, in the state of Illinois, for us, this is literally a, was a huge and massive bailout the way the formula was constructed for Chicago and specifically the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. So there's no way that I could send more money to Chicago with nothing being outcome-based, no metrics on student performance. So I was a no. I was going to say, you had said on the House floor debate that there's nothing in here to measure student accomplishments. And, uh, That's right. Is, is, was that ever a part of the discussion? Never. Uh, had, no? No, this was never. A student performance had never been one of the metrics. What they did is they said, well, we think we know that what we, how to build the ideal school to get the best results for students, yet no, the money, even in year two, three, four, after you build your ideal school, none of the future money ever depended on the results or the performance of that school, never. You can't build a funding model that way. Additionally, I can prove through data that we have a number of schools that are spending less than the state average and performing better than the state average. We have schools where you've got $27,000 going per kid and only 19% of the kids are at grade level. So we've already been down this road, we've already experimented with sending lots of money to schools and finding out that that's not necessarily the answer. I didn't know as a listening to this until Representative Davis got up and started talking about what was in the bill. It seemed to me that it was lopsidedly in favor uh, of the Democratic side of the aisle as far as what Absolutely. they wanted and, and that there was really marginal things in there, a little bit of mandate relief, uh, that some of the things the Republicans wanted, uh, putting the monies for the Chicago pension into the pension fund and not into the education sure. fund. Were, were you surprised given the what this bill contained in favor of Chicago, that it went down, or what was your reaction to that? Actually, I am a little bit surprised, especially just prior to the vote. You had the um, head of Chicago Public Schools essentially saying, this is a great deal for us. What are you thinking? We're going to get $450 million more. We're going to get, that's $150 million more than we were expecting to get in this latest version. That is a massive increase in, in uh, money towards to Chicago, in addition to the amounts of money that they currently get. So, I, you know what surprised me is that, and what everybody should wake up to, the fact of is, this shows you the strength of the teacher unions, specifically Chicago teacher unions, when it comes to legislation. Everybody should wake up to this fact. The power of the public sector unions in the state of Illinois is enormous. For a minor $75 million tax credit, they were willing to give away $450 million of cash on hand that would have done nothing but fed teacher compensation and benefits for years on end. They are so myopic in their view towards tax credit scholarships and letting anybody escape the bad performing schools that they have, that they gave up massive amounts of, of, a, bailout, of a bailout for their pensions. Massive amounts just to stop the tax credit scholarship. That is phenomenal. So as we stand here, and you, I know you got to get, get going. The Republicans are in a caucus. I suspect the Democrats are probably going to caucus as well. What happens now? I don't know. I mean, the suspicion is that we're going to be called back immediately to see if there's enough Republicans. If you, they only need four to basically override uh, the governor's veto of SB1 original. I guess that attempt will be made. And then if that doesn't work, we're back to the drawing table. I'm hoping for a better bill. That's what I'm hoping for. All right. Thank, thank you. you for joining. Yep. Representative Dave McSweeney, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. And uh, given the vote that we just had on the rewritten education funding bill, did you ever seriously consider, knowing what you knew about the rewrite, consider voting for it? And, and if not, what you voted against it. What, what were the reasons behind your vote? Well, I never considered it, because this is $7.5 billion of additional spending. I was a strong opponent of the tax increase. It's going to kill jobs, kill economic opportunity. This will just result in another tax increase. This bill was off. It also had uh, property tax increase for Chicago. A lot of new spending, $450 million more for CPS. And frankly, I'm very confused about what the governor's position is. He said he would sign it on Thursday. Uh, he'd spent months railing against uh, the CPS money. And on Friday, he said it's a bailout. I understand he said he would sign it today, but this bill is dead. I do favor scholarship grants. 
but they should be paid for. $75 million a year, we should cut spending to pay for it. I do favor that part of the bill, but the overall bill was a uh, disaster. And only got 46 votes. Uh, that, that, that is a complete repudiation of this bill. Were you surprised by the lopsided nature of the vote? No, I thought uh, it was going to be about uh, that. Uh, I know that there was a lot of opposition on, on both sides. And uh, I think right now, the best solution is just simply to release the money. This The money's already been appropriated. I oppose tax increase. I oppose the budget. What we're dealing with right now is there's a requirement that we create a new education formula in order to release the money. We should just do a simple bill that says that we're not ready right now for a new education formula and delete the requirement to do a new formula, release the money, and deal with this over the next year. That's yeah. the best solution. Yeah, because we have the money in the budget. Money's ready to go. Money's ready to go, but they're saying in order to do it, that we have to spend seven and a half billion dollars over the next ten years for new education for them. That we got to raise property taxes. We have to give four hundred fifty million dollars to CPS. That's unnecessary. We should appropriate the money. Make sure the schools are opening. But uh, this is a bad bill. How much? Do you remember the number? How much is in the uh, budget for education K twelve? Eight point two billion dollars for fiscal year eighteen. 8.2, and, and yeah, I think a lot of times when people were hearing 350 million, 450 million, as you probably know, people really don't have a handle on how much money we're actually spending on education. And, and it continues budget. to increase. And uh, I want to make sure we get money to the classroom. That was one of the points I made in my floor speech. There's nothing in this bill that requires the money to go to the classroom. We spend on administrators, pensions. That's the problem. And uh, people are leaving this thing because taxes are too high. We need to repeal the mandate tax increase. We need to cut spending. We need to reform pensions. We need to reform Medicaid. This was a bad bill, and uh, it was a, it was a humiliating defeat. Forty six votes. Uh, it's not even close. And, and of that, I think something like twenty seven were from Republicans. I'm not sure of the final number, which is a, a humiliating defeat. You're a smart guy with money. Uh, do you have any insights? And what would you do to bring down property taxes? Do you have any? Sure. I, I, what we need to do is uh, we need to require uh, yeah. for all units of government, except for uh, school districts and community colleges, a 10% reduction in the levies uh, over the next uh, two years, and then a permanent freeze after that. For K-12 through uh, education, for community colleges, we should permanently freeze those property taxes. And then by referendum, if local people want to raise those taxes, then they'd have that right, but only by referendum. Property taxes are killing uh, this state, killing jobs, families are being driven out of this state, taxes are too high, we need to reform the state. We won't keep you too long, but one of the provisions or one of the thoughts behind rewriting the bill, or the formula, I should say, as Senator Menorah said, that, you know, when you get areas like the South Side of Chicago or East St. Louis where they have really low property values or rural areas where they have no density of, let's say, commercial properties to tax, that they're at a disadvantage in funding the schools. Do you think that holds water? I think Senator Menard has done a lot of good work on this. I think this bill needs some work. I agree we need a new education formula, but we're not ready to do it right now. We need to make sure that we're making sure the money is in the classroom. We need to allow consolidation. Uh, we need to allow property tax uh, reduction. We need a new school aid formula, but we should release the money for this year and deal with that over the next year. And lastly, Senator, or uh, I should say Representative Ginny Ives brought up that there was nothing in the bill measuring student accomplishment. And she makes a very good point. Should there be a, should that be a consideration? Should we say maybe you get so much money, but maybe you get a, a bonus or something that's tied to the school performance? I think it's something we should look at very closely. I think that's really legitimate. We need to make sure uh, that we're incentivizing good performance. All right. Well, thank you for joining. Great. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Mike Jacoby and Dr. Frank Clark, thanks for joining us on the online channel. We just had uh, quite a back and forth in the House chamber. They voted down SB 1947, tried an override of SB 1, and then on second consideration passed SB 47. So the House has done it, has to go to the Senate now. What are your thoughts, both of you, as far as what this bill would mean for education and, and just on its passage, what are you thinking of? Well, first of all, we're very excited that school funding reform is now continuing to move on. Uh, at some level, we pointed at the elements of the compromise that we think are not necessarily excellent for public education, such as you know, the voucher credit uh, provision, such as you know, a property tax uh, levy reduction with a referendum vote. Those are things that we never intended to be part of school funding reform. But obviously those are pieces that need to be part of the compromise in order to get to this place. But the, the real issue is that schools are open, we need funding, the evidence-based model, all we prepared technically to make this a 
best funding model that we can think of in the country. It's all there. And we're glad that it was kept intact. <clears throat> and for the viewers, it's Mike, you run the uh, school business officials, at least presuming the Senate passes this. At least now you'll know what you're dealing with as far as trying to run the schools. Well, there'll be a lot of relief among my members that are looking at their budgets, looking at how far they can go with their own cash flow. Uh, obviously, there are many districts in the state that are really struggling with that. Other districts are in pretty good shape, but that's the reason why we need to reform education funding, because we need to get all districts to place of stability. Brian Clark, uh, when we spoke not too long ago, you had said that basically the governor's veto mandatory veto where he made changes really gutted SB1, the, the whole point of it. Yeah. What do you think now as far as the version that passed? Well, what you saw today with 1947 was essentially all of SB1 back in the bill, plus the compromise items that had been negotiated over the last week or so among the four legislative leaders. So I think it sort of underscores the, the, the strength that SB1 actually has had all along. It's withstood an enormous amount of pressure, uh, introspection, scrutiny, those numbers have been up forever. Everybody's had a chance to take a shot at it, and uh, that, that, that those components of SB1 are in 1947 just passed. So I think that speaks to the, the quality of the bill, uh, the things that were put into SB1 to make it a tremendous evidence-based model, much better than has been passed in some other states. There are some distinct components of our bill and our program that are uh, way more improved, and we think sets it apart to be potentially the best funding distribution system in the United States. How long would you estimate that we, once this, let's presume it goes into effect, at what point would we judge if this has been successful, the change? I think you've got to give it a few years. I mean, we are so uh, starved at the, at the school district level and have been for not, about eight years that we've, we've got some catch-up to do and then we've got to rebuild our systems. So I would say, if, if standing here in maybe four, five, six years, somewhere in that time frame, we should really start to see some, some inputs and some output, if you will, some pr pr production uh, of, the, of the root causes of the program that's, that's embedded in, in the evidence-based model. So give it some time, give people an ability to invest those dollars and get the return on, on the investment through the production of their kids. But I think in, in somewhere around the five-year mark, we'll be able to see some real improvements. And within the, the bill, there is a requirement for the review panel to actually do that study in five years to see how the evidence-based model is actually improving on state goals. So we'll see that as a formal study, but we'll also see that, I think, happening as schools receive the resources they need to implement those types of practices. But again, when we're starting from such a deficit, it's going to take a little while for us to get resources to, to many districts in order for them to actually begin to implement. And one of the things that Andy Menard, who was a principal backer of this effort, uh, Senator Menard was trying to say that the property values in places like in East St. Louis or South Side Chicago where they're depressed uh, don't provide enough income to the local schools. And then you have the agricultural areas where there's not a density of the population to tax enough. Does this bill address those concerns? Well, the whole point of this bill in terms of equity is trying to compensate for those differences. But you have to do that with an adequacy target you're shooting for. And that's been one of the elusive things in Illinois. We haven't really had that number, that, that programmatic cost uh, expectation for all districts. So we give them that expectation, and then the dollars flow where those other resources are not available. So that begins to build a more equitable opportunity for kids across the state. Gentlemen, we could talk about this obviously a lot more. We'll let you go, and hopefully we can follow up again in a couple of months. And review how we've been, but we thank you for joining well, us. Well, tomorrow's, tomorrow, we're, done, we're not done until tomorrow. Well, yes. as we stand here, the Senate has to vote right. tomorrow. By the way, I should ask, have you, uh, I presume you've talked to members of the Senate about this. Do you have a feel for how that vote would go? Uh, we did today. Uh, I, I think the Senate was waiting to see how the theatrics played out in the House. Uh, I have a feeling that the Senate uh, realizes the historic moment that we're standing in, and I do not think that they will let it fail. I think they'll find a way to, to pass the to pass the bill tomorrow.
Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Representative Will Davis, thanks for joining us on the uh, Illinois Channel, and uh, congratulations to you for the passage of SB uh, 1947, the newer version of the school funding formula. <laughs> uh, this was quite a back and forth, and in, in case, uh, I'll say in this interview, in case people didn't take the time to watch the whole thing, it failed the first time, and by a considerable margin, there was an effort to override immediately after that uh, the SB1, which was the previous version of the school funding formula. Yes. That override failed, and then you brought back the same bill on reconsideration, and this time it passed overwhelmingly. How did that happen on the vote? What was behind that uh, from, for those people who are trying to figure out how democracy works <laughs> in the House of Representatives? Well, at least on our side of the aisle, there was a lot of conversation among the members about at least taking a run and overriding uh, the veto of Senate Bill 1. Uh, even if it failed, at least members wanted to say that we at least tried to go that route. But mind you, overriding Senate Bill 1, um, is a version of the bill that wasn't quite what the compromise that was passed provided, even absent of the tax credit, uh, the scholarship portion of it. Um, but it still did a lot of good things, obviously. So I think there was a desire to at least try that first before we came back and ultimately vote to uh, on some of the rights of the I want to get in a little bit to the guts, but let me just stay in the politics for a minute. It seemed like what the the real bugaboo politically was this private scholarship fund that's going to be funded where they get a tax credit of seven, up to $75 million. And from what I hear, the teacher unions were very much against it. On the other hand, the governor was very much for it. Mm -hmm. And it, it is kind of amazing to look at because you had members voting in the House from the Chicago area against the first time as 1947, even though that had, am I right, $100 million more for Chicago than SB1? Well, I, I think the differences between funding for Chicago between the two weren't, not that they weren't huge, but, you know, they were relatively the same with regard to the city, the city of Chicago. Um, I think what members uh, were experiencing is the fact that there needed to be something. Something had to happen with regard to this because there was a lot riding on the passage of this bill. I mean, at the very least, we needed to pass an evidence-based evidence -based funding model in order to provide the mechanism to push money over to schools. That model provides a high level of transparency and accountability for the districts that we've never had before. There is the minimum funding rule that's in the bill, that $350 million, an amount of money that we've never put on the front end into schools before, setting unique adequacy targets for districts so that we can push money to the districts that need it most versus those that don't, um, putting in some provisions to help with property taxes as well. I, I just want to, I think sometimes we confuse people on the $350 million. I mean, because the state, what the people should know, the state is spending billions of dollars. Oh, yes on education. Absolutely. But I think sometimes they hear that 350 and they think that's what we're spending around the state. No. What is the 350 million? That represents the new dollars, new dollars on top of what we're currently spending that we would add to help with the evidence-based funding formula, pushing additional money out to school districts. Under this new formula, no district loses money and every district in the state gains, whether it's millions of dollars all the way down to hundreds of thousands of dollars. But every district gains under under new, under the new formula, and I think the thing about with the tax credit that we want to be clear about is is that it doesn't take money away from the 350 million dollars. The tax credit is dealt with a little differently in the budgetary process, and we'll have to figure that out through the budget and appropriations process, if you will. But it doesn't take money away from what we initially allocate in this funding model towards schools. So again, it doesn't take anything away and it's a tax credit for the people that decide to donate to the fund that ultimately provides the scholarships for students that fall into certain categories. We did an interview with Mr. Jarrett of the Hartland uh, Institute and uh, about that. And so again, just in case people didn't hear it, it's basically setting up a scholarship fund that people can apply for, students can apply for their families using private dollars from donors. Yes. And if the donors donate, whether it's $100 or a million dollars, 
uh, they can take a credit, which is 100% of what they donated. Can I say it's not 100%, it's only 75%. Oh, it's a, so, okay, I'm glad for that mm -hmm. clarification. So it's a 75% credit. Yes. Um, off their taxes. But the point of Lisa the Hartman Institute would say, this isn't like a school voucher which uses tax money to right. the schools, it's private money. That's it. Let me, let's go to, I want to know a little bit about how, what you had to go through to get some of this done. So we had the uh, governor vetoed, obviously, uh, SB1. Um, when did 1947 come about? When did all of those discussions, when were they being held and, and how quickly did it start to gel? And of course, in the context of this, you were all up against this deadline that the schools have already started. Right, I would say probably about three, three and a half weeks ago when the legislators that were negotiating um, what would have been a, a, a compromise toward SB1, uh, we kind of got to a point where unfortunately the conversation needed to be escalated to the leaders to figure out a couple of key points, particularly as it relates to pensions, or City of Chicago, or CPS, if you will, as well as um, this uh, tax credit program that had been put on the table. Uh, the way the program was initially brought, um, they wanted a $100 million fund that had escalators to increase every year if the, if the uh, donations were maxed out, plus they wanted a dollar-for-dollar dollar tax credit to go along with it. Um, they wanted the per program to be permanent, so the way it was brought to us is certainly not the way that it landed, but after you know several weeks of legislators negotiating, it, need, it required us to then push that conversation up to the four legislative leaders and the governor, which ultimately settled on a compromise. And I think the reason why it ultimately became Senate Bill 1947 is that unfortunately, the governor characterized SB1 as a Chicago bailout, which we have proven over and over again that it's not a Chicago bailout, but sometimes the sound bite is what rules the day. And that sound bite caused a lot of members on both sides of the aisle some, uh, some challenges in terms of trying to be an advocate for all the great things that were coming about in Senate Bill 1. So I think the idea of using a different number was simply to try to alleviate those issues, try to get rid of that negative commentary about what we were trying to do, and try to create something fresh and new that members can now identify with that wasn't initially characterized as a Chicago bailout. In the original debate, which was the primary debate of, of the bill, uh, we heard a lot of times that nobody was getting everything they wanted. It, was, it really did seem like a, a very compromised piece of legislation. Right. Now, no one in the state, on either side of the aisle, or anyone in and out of the Capitol, everyone wants children to be well-educated. Mm -hmm. I think there was the consensus, it was 20 years ago that we had the last funding formula. There was problems, especially they became uh, more obvious as time went on. Knowing what you know about this bill, um, what, what are your thoughts? Are we, have we made a big improvement? Have we made a marginal improvement? And when will we know the difference? Well, I think we've made a huge improvement. Again, we create a model that, is, that we're able to track the dollars that we're pushing out to school districts and measure it at that level um, to try to see exactly what outcomes we're getting for the, for the dollars that we are invested. Again, we set unique adequacy targets for districts that makes every district unique. The previous funding formula basically said all districts were the same. Here's some money, go spend it. This is doing things a lot different than we've done in the past with those unique adequacy targets and pushing those districts that are furthest away from the adequacy target up to the front of the line so that they get those dollars first so we can really start to close those educational gaps that exist among districts. Uh, there's plenty of studies that show that particularly for low-income students, bilingual students, and special education students, you need to have adequate resources in order to provide them with the uh, appropriate education. Senate Bill 1947, as it is now, pushes us and starts us in the right direction in terms of what we allocate. So again, now we have an allocation level, that minimum funding level of $350 million is the highest we've ever had. And that starts the ball to rolling. Hopefully next year, we certainly don't want to go any lower than that, and hopefully we're arguing and advocating for more money to put toward education so we can start to close those gaps even quicker than we would under the way the, uh, the plan is currently laid out. People will say, and I think there's a lot of evidence to this, there's no direct correlation between what we spend on education and the results we get. You have different places like Washington, D.C. schools that have traditionally spent a lot of money, but they have very 
poor results in, their, in those. Uh, in other places like uh, Dakotas, where they spend little money, but they have fairly good results, at least as far as ACT scores and that kind of thing. Is there some way of tying student performance to future funding, or, or should we have that as a connection? Um, or would you expect to see in some of these districts where we have low graduation rates that we're, because of this funding formula, we're going to see higher graduation rates? Well, the expectation is that we'll start to see all of those educational outcomes improve with the appropriate investment. Um, I have a tendency to pay attention to, for, to the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, which is a bipartisan or nonpartisan, if you will, tax policy think tank. And their studies have shown that you need to have that investment in kids, um, particularly for low-income, bilingual, special education children, to get the outcomes that you desire. But this model sets us on a path of how we measure those outcomes. Can't speak to the other states, but certainly South Dakota is a lot different than Illinois. Much more homogenous state, with not a lot of the challenges that we have here in the state of Illinois. Uh, Washington, D.C., I'm not quite sure how they're tracking what they're doing or what is their system for distributing those dollars. So it's really not just spending more. You also have to put the other pieces in place so you can track and, and hold districts accountable for the dollars that they're receiving, but create mechanisms that when they're not quite meeting those outcomes, instead of being punitive, you're able to work with districts and examine how they're spending the dollars and see, well, maybe we should consider spending more money in this area or this area versus where you're spending it right now. Senate Bill 1947, using the evidence-based model, allows us the opportunity to be able to go in and make these kind of uh, decisions, make these kinds of assessments, and ultimately make uh, a variety of decisions based on the amount of dollars that we're spending, but all leading toward improved educational outcomes. And just two things briefly, and then we'll wrap, but uh, evidence-based model, we hear that. Yes. Uh, so let me just paraphrase what I understand it to be, that we've looked around the country and seen what are the best practices, and so we're going to use the, those practices. That's what we wanted to be as part and parcel of our education system what were the best practices around the country? Is that more or less it? Yeah, that's, that's more or less it, but Illinois, to its credit, has the most comprehensive evidence-based model being used as a result of passage of this piece of legislation. I mean, when you look at the 27 elements, a, a state or a school district uh, or a state can make the decision, maybe we don't want to use all of those elements. Here are the most important elements, and we'll just use those. But right now, Illinois has the most comprehensive use of an evidence-based model using 27 elements as the mechanism to provide resources to schools. But also in the bill is what we call a professional review panel where a group of experts that will ultimately be appointed by the governor and legislative leaders will make the decision as to making sure whether or not we need all 27 elements in the future. Maybe there are some other elements that we haven't considered that we might need to use and remove others, but they will be tasked with making sure that the approach that we're taking right now is A, the right approach, or if it needs changing or tweaking, they will have the responsibility of making those recommendations to the General Assembly so that we can take them up and presumably agree with what their recommendations are. And that was the other question I was going to say. The point is there's part and parcel of this is you have a review process. So yes. it, it's not like the Ten Commandments. Yeah. After a while, you're going to look at it and say, we can tweak this, and that's kind of part and parcel of this process, right? Absolutely. That's, that's the sole purpose of having that review panel, and we will charge them as, as education professions to do that. Um, I argue that it shouldn't be a bunch of legislators. Uh, let the experts make those, have those conversations, and at least offer us the recommendations based on their expert opinion, and then we can examine them as legislators, bring them back in, talk, ask questions, and get further clarification on whatever is needed in order to make good decisions. And then, as we somewhat touched on the other thing, I mean, it's easy to overlook with all this politics back and forth, but uh, vouchers cannot work in Illinois vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Court. They yes. said you can't do that. But this is an alternative program for those who wanted to have vouchers, that it's a privately funded plan. So I'm not sure of all the details how that works, but at least that is there, and that's something that is also new, and I guess people will review and see the results of that. Yeah, members uh, talked about having a process by which to at least kind of vet the program, and even though it wasn't done on the front end, the implementation of this doesn't start to next school.